Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I welcome you to this Labor Day Convention. And I have a sense in my spirit that God wants to meet with his people. That uh, is a theme in my spirit in these days and weeks and months. God has been speaking that over and over like a repeated note in my consciousness. God, in these days in which we live, and I don't mean just for us folks here, but I mean all throughout the body of Christ and the earth. These days are going to be days of God meeting with his people. How many can praise God for that? Amen. Hallelujah. I sense a new clarification and a new moving in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. So I praise the name of our God tonight and I want to first glorify him and secondly welcome you and bless you in Jesus' name. The thought has occurred to me that here we are, about 30 centuries after Moses and the children of Israel came out, here we are in the wilderness to worship the Lord. <laughs> is that all right? That's a good thing, isn't it? Praise God. I'm going to be looking for the face of Christ in this convention. Hallelujah. I'm going to be looking for his face. I'm going to be looking for his presence. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want to have God's presence in everything. I want to have God's presence in this offering I'm about to take. <laughs> and Elijah thought that way. and uh, He said, I alone am left. And God made him to know that there were yet 7,000. <laughs> who hadn't bowed the knee to Baal. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, it's one thing to know that there are some out there, but it's something very special to be able to join with them and to have uh, a time such as this, a time of worship together and fellowship together, and gathering together unto Him. Praise God. I've been aware for many years that gatherings of this type, convocations of this type, ought to be holy convocations, and that we should not approach them casually. And I'd like to just sound that note forth tonight, that when we come into the realm of, of God's Word and God's Spirit, God's presence, we are indeed standing on holy ground. Amen. Amen. We stand upon holy ground tonight and we want to take the shoes off our feet and acknowledge that he is a holy God. Amen. When Isaiah was, became attuned to that dimension, as Brother Wilbur mentioned, the dimension of the throne, he heard a song, he heard a throng giving forth a, a melody, a song, and crying out, Holy, holy is the Lord. <laughs> Amen. The Lord is holy. Amen. So we deal with sacred things when we deal with the Word of God and the Spirit of God and all things related to that. My concern tonight is that God would accomplish the work that I do feel He has in his heart and mind for the remainder of this gathering. That my desire is not to just dispense some information or deal with certain scriptures, but that we might be able to tune in to what the Lord has for us tonight and appropriate it, and that this gathering might be fruitful for him and for his purpose. Can we agree together? Amen. Let's just pause for a word of prayer to that end. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Oh, God, we, we just call upon the name of Jesus. And we come to the throne knowing that it is a throne of grace and mercy. Where we can find help in time of need. And Lord, tonight we ask for grace for the remainder of this service. 
that enabling power, O oh God, that permits us to, to know your will and your mind and to somehow utter it forth. Help us, Lord, to speak your will and your mind for this gathering. And give us that grace, O oh Lord, that will enable us to hear, that will enable us to open our hearts towards you, that your word and your spirit might find a proper lodging place, that fruit might be brought forth unto thee, O God. Hallelujah. We just pray in faith believing, and we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. Through Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. I'd like to have you turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel. And we could focus in on several verses here which we might use as somewhat of a text for those things which we want to share tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 9 and let's look at verses 15, 16, and 17. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Now I'd like to just make mention of the fact that we are going to make reference tonight to an Old Testament character by the name of Saul. And I realize that most of the time when we think of Saul of the Old Testament, we think of one who missed God. We think of one who had opportunity, but who quickly became disobedient and was rejected. I'd like to call your attention to the fact that in 1 Samuel chapters 9 and 10, we find Saul uh, in the time of, of uh, God's choosing of him and calling of him and uh, uh, at a time before he was put to the test, shall we say, and became disobedient. So that I do believe that we can draw some, some spiritual truths and we can get some insights from God's dealings with this man. I appreciate the Old Testament Amen. for it, it gives us many insights First of all, as to our own nature, I find Old Testament people and New Testament people very much the same when it comes to uh, our need of being dealt with by the Lord and uh, prepared of the Lord. And uh, I also find us much the same in our tendency toward rebellion and disobedience and stubbornness. He found them to be a stubborn people in the Old Testament, and sometimes I think that that trait somehow still carries on, carries through. And so God has to deal with us. And uh, we find in these two chapters uh, a story or an account of how God chose a man for a certain purpose, called him, apprehended him, dealt with him, and began to prepare him. And in these verses which I pointed out, we find that the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of. This same shall reign over my people. Let us focus in particular to a few of those words out of verse 16. God speaking to Samuel and saying, Tomorrow about this time, I will send thee a man. That inspires me with the thought that, that God is always looking for a man. From the beginning, God sought after a man. 
Somehow God has ordained that he would establish his purpose through a human instrument. And in the beginning, we find this thought coming forth as God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let him have dominion. God has, has desired to express himself and to establish somewhat of his glory and of his character in, in this planet Earth and throughout the universe. And he has chosen to do this through an instrumentality called man. And so in the beginning he created man. Hallelujah. How many of you realize tonight that God, who is spirit, has one basic need, and that is he needs a body and a means of expressing himself. All that are of such have that basic need. Everything that is spirit, all that are in that dimension of spirit require a body through which to find express, expression. Even those uh, that we call evil spirits, you know how that they seek out an habitation. They seek out a body to dwell in that they might find expression, that they might take over that uh, particular instrumentality. And so God has one basic need. We always come to God with our needs, but we do need to realize that God has needs. This is one of God's basic needs. He needs an instrument through which to manifest himself, express himself, and through which to establish his purpose in the earth. Hallelujah. And I believe tonight and I feel tonight that part of what God wants to do in this convention is to apprehend you and me in this meeting and uh, draw us closer to himself and begin to share with us somewhat of his plan and purpose. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. That God would draw man to himself and begin to share his thoughts, his intentions, those things that uh, would be called his eternal purpose. Hallelujah. God's desire toward us tonight, in fact, is that we be his friends. Amen. Amen. He says, I'm not called you servants, but I've called you friends. Amen. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Hallelujah. So tonight, God is looking for friends. The real meaning there is intimate associates. Hallelujah. Do we realize how far God wants to lift us in this work that we call redemption? He wants to bring us all the way back into unity with himself, into union with himself. Amen. That we might partake of his mind, of his will, and of his purpose. Hallelujah. God is looking for friends, intimate associates. He's looking for an instrument, a vessel. He's looking for someone with whom he can have fellowship. Hallelujah. God is working. God is moving in the earth today. And I believe that even as in this occasion, so it is today, God is looking for a man. In Ezekiel, we find a, a verse that is rather sad in its ending, but at the same time expresses this very thought that I'm on. In Ezekiel 22 and 30, you don't have to turn to this, it's just a passing thought. God said in that situation, I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it but I found none. Isn't that sad? God looking for a man for a purpose and yet unable to find even one in that particular situation. God has always sought for man. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ said, I am come to seek and to save that which was lost. Did you ever look at it that way that in the fall and through sin, we not only lost a great deal, but God also lost his man. 
God lost his instrumentality. And in redemption, God is out to recover for us all that we have lost. But I want you to know that he's also purposing to recover for himself. Amen. All that he has lost. How many of you believe that God will yet have a man? Amen. Amen? He will yet have a man. He already has his man. Amen. His man is Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. But in the ultimate expression of this man, he is to be a corporate man. Praise the Lord. And all of us that are brought into Christ become part of a wonderful corporate man. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Did you know that the church is to become a man? He's given to the church apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. And it goes on to say, till we all come unto a perfect man. Hallelujah. Unto the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ. Hallelujah. God is going to have a man in the earth. Amen. He's looking for a man today. He's looking for a man today. Let's just for a moment reflect on a number of situations down through the Old Testament history. How that every situation, in every situation, God sought for a man. You recall how he set out after Abraham, or Abram, shall we call him, an Ur of the Chaldees. And he chose him for his man to work out a grand and glorious purpose. He called out his man. He revealed himself unto his man. He dealt with him. He covenanted with him. And through him and, uh, through him and his seed, he purposed that this man would become a corporate man. Hallelujah. When God sent Moses in before Pharaoh, God looked upon the, the, the multitudes of Israel, not just as a lot of scattered people or a great bunch of people, but it was a corporate man. Hallelujah. A many-membered instrument. Uh, and God said, Moses, when you go in there before Pharaoh, you tell him to let my son go. Israel was his son. Israel was his instrument that, in whom and through whom God had a purpose. Praise God. I think of a number of situations, and we will not have the time to cover all of them, but let us focus on this for a few minutes tonight that a number of, of various situations arose down through the history of God's people. Take for instance the hour when Goliath was in the valley parading up and down and defying the armies of Israel. And all of Israel was, shall we call them, paralyzed with fear. And there was a danger that God's people would be enslaved and brought captive to the Philistines. Can we appreciate the fact that this was a most unique situation at that time? It was an hour of, of, of great need. It was very critical. The threat was a very real threat. But I don't believe the majority of the Israelites realized how critical things were. But there was a lad there named David, and he was aware of the implications of Goliath, and he was aware of what could possibly happen. That this nation of people that were called to be the head over nations, might become the tail in, instead. And so, so he rose up. And when others tried to restrain him, he said, is there not a cause? Hallelujah. And David became God's man for that particular situation. Hallelujah. Goliath was demanding a man. Choose ye out a man to fight with me. 
And if he wins, we'll, we'll submit ourselves to you. But if I win, all of you will become our slaves. Choose you out a man. The situation demanded a man in that hour. And thank God for Israel that David rose to the occasion and became God's man for that hour. And he announced by the inspiration of the Spirit, thy servant will go and fight. Hallelujah. And he wrought deliverance for Israel in that hour. Praise God. That was vitally important. And we could go on to enumerate a number of other instances. For example, let's take a, uh, one or two more how that there was a, a time when the uh, Persians were in the ascendancy in the earth. And a decree had gone forth which meant the annihilation of all God's people, the Jews. And that was no small thing because the law of the Medes and the Persians is irreversible. But God, how many of you know God is never caught off guard? He's never caught unprepared. Even before a situation comes to its critical point, God is preparing his instrument. Hallelujah. In this case, an Esther, a woman. Hallelujah. Raised up in the fear of the Lord. Uh, nurtured by Mordecai, a type of the Holy Spirit. And through the various dealings of God and, and uh, the, the supernatural intervention of God, she is brought unto the very throne of the kingdom of Persia. Hallelujah. And when the crisis unfolds, Mordecai takes her aside and says, Esther, there's a crisis, there is a need, and you have been especially chosen of God, and you have been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. Yes. Hallelujah. And God has it, had his instrument on hand at that time. It was a woman. <laughs> Thank God. Amen. And Esther rose to the challenge and she laid her life on the line and she said, if I perish, I perish. And deliverance was wrought because God had a man, if you please. Amen. God had an instrument that responded to the call, that yielded to the preparations necessary to bring that person to a place of usefulness. You know what I sense in this hour? I sense that we're living in critical times. I sense that there's a great need emerging on the scene. And that from God's point of view, he has need for an instrument to stand in the earth in this hour. For an instrument to do his bidding. For an instrument that will be molded and made by him. That will fellowship his heart. I want to tell you, man today is in the business of molding and making a lot of people. Man is out there making his man, as it were. And the world is out there putting out their men. But I want to tell you, there's a dimension. It's, it's called, let us call it the dimension of the potter's wheel. Praise God. Where there are people, I do believe, that are still on God's potter's wheel. They're under the molding hand of God's Holy Spirit. They're exposed to the Word of God. They're tuning into the mind of God. They are not willing to be wanting to be contaminated with that which is, is, is coming forth in other areas and other dimensions. They are being uh, exposed solely, I believe, to the molding and makings of God. And God is preparing us and raising us up for such an hour as this. Hallelujah. Oh, God, help us to sound this note forth tonight. Not only in this place, but across the land. That God has need of an instrument. That God has need of a man. All right? So God seeks for a man. 
And he has a man chosen for every particular task. Do you believe that? He has a, a chosen instrument. Everywhere tonight where there's a need, where there's a field of need or a field of ministry, I believe he has his chosen vessels already picked out. It then becomes a matter of whether they can be apprehended, whether they can hear the voice of God. How many of you know you and I have to come to a place where we can hear the voice of God? In the year the King Uzziah died, something happened to Isaiah. And when he went into the temple one day, suddenly his ears were opened. And he heard, among other things, he heard the voice of one saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I have a feeling it wasn't the first time God said it. But it may have been the first time that there was any human instrument around to hear it. Do you believe God speaking today? I believe God is speaking. But where are the people that are hearing? How important it is to hear when God speaks. Thank God for the story of Samuel. How he ministered unto the Lord and, and exposed himself, made himself available, and finally learned to recognize the voice of the Lord that was calling him. Hallelujah. This may have not have been the perfect plan and order of God here in the day of Saul. In fact, you know that it was the people that had, were asking for a king, that they might be like other nations. But nonetheless, God was submitting to that request. And his command to Samuel was, give them a king. And being, being, though it be in the category of God's, what we might call God's permissible will, and I believe there is that, be it in that realm, we still see that there's a situation for which God is needing a man. He's needing a man to be king. And he has chosen his man, and it is Saul. So, we see that a man has been chosen. It is this man Saul, the son of Kish. But there's something interesting here that we can observe, which I believe has been true many times of God's chosen man. How many of you know that you can be God's chosen man, but be totally ignorant of it? In this story, we find that there are two settings. Can we just focus in on two settings? One on my left and one on my right, shall we call them? On the one hand, we find that God's man, Saul, is involved in a project for his father. The donkeys of his father have been lost, and he has been commissioned to go out and find these donkeys. And we see him wandering from one place to another, here and there. And I don't know really how long this was going on. But it, it is evident that this becomes something that is preoccupying Saul's mind. Just about the only thing that is on Saul's mind is finding his father's donkeys. And his mind is set on that. And when mention is made about the prophet of God, it is only in that direction. Oh yes, there's a man of God in the land, and he's a really a true prophet. We understand that whatever he says will surely come to pass. Why don't we go to him to see if he'll help us find the donkeys? And you'll find that in the account if you wish to read it in 1 Samuel chapter 9. Here's the servant, Saul and his servant, that are 
um, highly involved, obsessed with this problem. How do we find or where do we find these donkeys? Let's go to the man of God to uh, tell us the way or to show us, give us some revelation as to how to solve our problem. But on, in another setting, over, over on, uh, in another dimension of things, you'll find there's a prophet Samuel who's communicating with God. And God is speaking to Samuel and he's saying, the day before Saul is to come, he's saying, now look, uh, here's what I'm going to do now, uh, Samuel. I am going to give these people the king. I'm going to go along with it, though we have to protest, yet we are going to do it. And uh, I have chosen a man for this project and for this mission. And tomorrow about this time, I'm going to send him to you. I have chosen my man and I'm going to send him to you. And so you see that here is a dimension that, that we say uh, has to do with the purposes of God, the high purpose of God, the need for that hour. Was a need for a man to be king. And so what's on God's mind is the provision of a king. Samuel's involved in this. What's on Saul's mind is something earthly. It's an earthly project. It's finding the donkeys. And I tell you folks, I am learning in this hour by uh, viewing my own life and the, the uh, uh, battle that I have and by observing the lives of those around me that in this hour we are all undergoing many, many distractions. There, we live in a life that is so complex and filled with things to do and demands upon us that it is quite easy to lose touch with what's going on in this dimension, what we call the dimension of the heavens. And Brother Wilbur mentioned it tonight, may God attune us to the throne. I don't want to lose touch with what's going on in the dimension of the throne where the purposes of God are, uh, shall we say, in motion. It's easy in this hour to become preoccupied with earthly things. And be ignorant of what God purposes towards us and for us. I am finding that the things that are the greatest dangers and snares to God's people are not the gross, ugly, gutter things that we might, as we might call them, the awful sins of the flesh, though certainly those are not to be condoned. But I find that it is oftentimes the earthly things the things of our natural life that preoccupy us and we can spend a lot of our time and energy and, our, and the thoughts of our mind concerning earthly things and fail to tune in to what God purposes for us as his people in this hour. Martha was encumbered about with many things, but Mary chose the good part sitting at Jesus' feet and hearing his word. The earth is. Now isn't it in interesting that Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Lord. Are you still believing with me that the Lord is coming soon? You know, that, that's become a kind of a, of, a, of a church doctrine without much conviction anymore. I believe we need to be awakened to the fact that this present order of things is soon to come to a close. Everything is screaming out for divine intervention. And I do believe there will be a bride company that will catch the mind of the Spirit and that will begin to cry out and pray, Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. I want to be found in that company that's aligned to the things in the heart of God. 
Hallelujah. Now, others are preparing to, you know, just to go on and live in this life. And they're preparing and learning. There's all kinds of seminars today, how you can better, and you know, how you can improve your life here on this earth. There's very few people that are preparing to end it all. That's right. Everyone, you know, bigger and better things. The spirit of the world. Next year it's going to be bigger and better. More profits the next quarter than this quarter. Tear down our barns and build greater. And we can have our mind, you know, on all this kind of a thing. Uh, Paul says, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hallelujah. That's such a needful work in this hour. The renewing of our mind in the truth and by the truth and towards God. Hallelujah. Preoccupied with early things, earthly things. I want to finish my thought. In that hour, now you know especially the conditions as they were in the days of Lot and also in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, the Bible says the imagination and thoughts of, of all men everywhere were only evil continually. Can you imagine that? In the days of Lot, you know, they were, there were days of, of immorality, homosexuality, and all those things similar to what we see today. And yet Jesus did not make mention of those things when he referred to the days of Noah and the days of Lot. He said this rather, and I think it's significant. See if I can locate it here. He said, in the days of Noah, can't put my finger on the scripture, but goes something like this. In the days of Noah, they were marrying and giving in marriage. They were eating and drinking. In the days of Lot, they were buying and selling. They were building and planting. And knew not until the flood came or until the judgments came. Isn't that an, awful, uh, an awesome message? All of those things can be looked upon as legitimate things. Nothing uh, sinful about marrying and giving in marriage. Eating and drinking, buying and selling, building and planting. But I really believe the message there is, is this, that there was a, 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 an, an inordinate participation in those things. An excessive involvement in those things. To the point where the spiritual man had become dull to God. You know, the spiritual man can become dull and can die and can start to wither away unless he is nourished and sustained in life. You and I have a responsibility to sustain our inner man in life. And a lot of times it's not, it's not the dirty, sinful, awful, terrible things that overcome us, but it can be the earthly, the natural, the pursuits of our natural earthly life. If we overindulge in any of these areas, these can dull our senses and cause us to become a part of a sleeping church. I believe there's a sleeping church out there in the land that are not aware of the time of day is. Preoccupied. Preoccupied. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven would, would be like this. It would be like one who made a feast, a wedding feast for his son and sent forth invitations for the guests to come. But he says with one consent they began to make excuse. And will you note their excuses? Their excuses are all along earthly lines. I have bought a piece of ground and I've got to go and see it. Oh, it's just urgent. I just can't make it. I'm sorry, I can't make it. Now you know it's a legitimate thing. It's a piece of ground. I'm not going out and getting into sin or anything. I have bought me five yoke of oxen and I, 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 just, I just have to go and prove them. 
I have to try them out. Oh, it's just, it's just imperative because tomorrow I have a big job coming up. I have to tend to these oxen. Or I have married a wife. Come on now. Come on now. A preoccupation with earthly things. And so Saul, God's man for that hour, is seen as being preoccupied with an earthly problem or an earthly project. May God deliver us from the realm of the earthlies and lift us into a dimension where the wheels of his purposes are moving forward. Can you say amen tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. There is a dimension where God is communicating with man concerning his present purpose. There's a Samuel that's tuning in. Hallelujah. There's something that God's about to establish in the earth in that hour. And God is out there drawing his man. How many of you know that when they came together, Saul had one thing on his mind and Samuel had another thing on his mind? It's so often the way it is when we go to prayer, isn't it? My Lord, this, 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 and all our problems. And our mind is so filled with problems. Now, don't misunderstand me. Don't misunderstand me that God is concerned about our problems. But how many of you would agree with me they don't weigh as heavily with Him as they do with us? And sometimes when our minds are full of, of uh, things that to us are real heavy, oh, this is so urgent, Lord. God is saying, now, look, I, I have something in my mind that's really urgent, too. And when these two come together, I like to look at it this way. God's man is apprehended. How many even know? You may be God's chosen, but there has to come in all of our lives that moment of apprehension. What does that mean? That means God coming and laying hold of us. How many of you know we cannot rise from our present state, no matter what it is. We cannot rise in ourselves until, as we've heard, heard tonight, we have a meeting with God. And I thank God our meetings with God are initiated by Him. Amen? Amen. Moses was content to dwell on the backside of the desert, but in his, in his pursuit of that particular occupation, occupation it says this he tended his father-in-law's sheep and came to the mountain of God <laughs> do you think that was just a chance happening no God deliberately intercepted him and arranged for a moment of divine meeting and apprehension hallelujah I don't know what you're doing sitting there tonight or how you're feeling right about now, but I want to tell you what I have in my heart tonight. I have a desire that this meeting be a moment of divine apprehension for some of you. Amen? That perhaps you've gone this way or that way, uh, ignorant of God's calling on your life and the fa ignorant of the fact that there's a purpose in your life. Uh, and I would, would that tonight might be a time, that special time when God is intercepting your life uh, and bringing in you an awakening, hallelujah. Uh, bringing in you, an, uh, towards you an apprehension, amen. That you might realize that your life is not your own, but that he has chosen you. For a divine purpose. Hallelujah. You're not here by chance tonight. Glory to God. We don't have to spend a Thursday night just to warm up in this convention, do we? Amen. 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 Can we get right down to business tonight? Amen. Can we get serious tonight? Can we allow God to make inroads into our lives tonight? Can we open up even the depths of our being unto Him tonight? You know how it seems to go in conventions one layer at a time. You know, Thursday night, well, you hardly make a dent. <laughs> and then maybe the next meeting you penetrate a little deeper. Oh, my God, my God, listen, the time is short. Yes. Hallelujah. And I, I, I feel very serious tonight. I feel that, that, that uh, the time is urgent. 
The time is short, and God wants to quickly apprehend the people. God wants to save us from ourselves. He wants to save us from men and from systems. Amen. And catch us up, hallelujah, into that activity of heaven. Amen. That out of there we might be sent forth and go forth into that realm of our calling and into that ministry that he has chosen for us. You can have uh, 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 thousands of slaves along, uh, lying along the, the river Kibar with their spirit deep, uh, oppressed and, and uh, having lost their song and somehow settling for another order of life. But I'll tell you, there's one among them. There's one among them, Ezekiel, for whom the heavens are open, glory to God. And he begins to, to be in tune with the activity of heaven. And he sees the wheels turning. And he sees the fire and the lightning and all of this. Heaven is preparing to do something. Oh, church of the living God, let's wake out of sleep in this hour and get in tune with the wheels of heaven. Glory to God. I believe there's God has a purpose for this end time. By the way, everything's in control. <laughs> Glory to God. It looks like things are out of hand. You know, uh, look at all the terrible stuff that's getting out of hand. Drugs and alcohol and oh, all these things. The international scene. And we could go on and on and on and on. But I want to tell you something. God is preparing his man. Hallelujah. God is working with the people. Hidden away, not popular, unknown. Glory to God. And they themselves wonder what's going on. What's he doing with me? I want to tell you. I want to tell you. He has a specific purpose. Amen. And as uh, Naomi said to Ruth concerning Boaz, he said, she said, this man will not rest until he has fulfilled the thing which concerns you. Amen. God's not going to rest. The watchmen give him no rest until he established him, until he made Jerusalem a praise in the earth. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, the renewing of our mind. Samuel said, look, uh, Saul, all of this wandering around, it, you know, it, actually it was your God bringing you to himself. God told me yesterday that you'd come here. And you thought it was for me to solve your problem. Listen, as far as that goes, don't set your mind on that. It's already solved. The donkeys are already found. Amen? <laughs> Glory to God. Amen? You know, in a sense, I tell you, we need to relate in an, in an attitude of faith toward all these problems, even the prayer needs that we've heard tonight. And I don't want to minimize. We have many of our own. But I want to tell you something. All of those, if we can approach in an attitude of faith, are as but small things before an almighty God. Amen? Amen. And even tonight, as we can, if we can go forth in other avenues tonight, in the spirit, other dimensions, if we can soar, God can say, don't set your mind on all these things. They're already taken care of. Amen. Something from his throne has already descended toward those situations, and they're already being solved. I believe that tonight. Amen. But tonight, it's you and me. It's you and me, the renewing of our mind. God lifting us out of those realms and beginning to hear what God has to say for us in this particular time. Hallelujah. And so we see a man that's preoccupied, but that is delivered. He's apprehended and he's awakened. My God, that's a coming awakening. Saul, God's chosen you to be captain over God's people. Can you imagine the shock? <laughs> it takes something like that to awaken us. Because most of us are like Gideon. Preoccupied. Here another man preoccupied. Oh, the Midianites are closing in. Doesn't look good. <laughs> they're, they're destroying all our fields. All the grains are gone. I better sneak out of this cave and, and cut down a little more and bring it back in. After all, we've got to eat tomorrow. <laughs> and that's the kind of a lifestyle he's involved in. And all of a sudden, an angel appears before him and says, God is with thee, you mighty man of valor. <laughs> oh, 
He says, he's chosen you to deliver Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Now you talk about divine interception. God needs to intercept us and to deliver us from all these pursuits that we uh, concentrate on and that, that take our time and bring us into worry and, and, and consume our energies. Oh my God, work a deliverance in this hour. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm man apprehended. I've chosen you, Saul. And then there's the usual reaction, <laughs> like they all made Moses, Gideon. Who, me, Lord? <laughs> and I hear some of this bouncing off some of you good people. I really do. Because some of you are in your spirit saying the same thing. Me call for something great and high. And what, what's he talking about? I, I'll be happy if I can get the Lord to solve this and that and the other. Are you with me tonight? And you've got to hear this right. I'm not despising our needs. Neither does the Lord. He knows our problems. And we can make our requests known. But, folks, at the same time, I want you to know, God's looking for a man. God's wanting to share his heart with the people. God's wanting to apprehend us for high and great things in these last days. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Saul comes and you can see how this whole thing is, is unfolding in a way and in a manner that he never dreamed about. Here's this great prophet that's saying, you know what, Saul? I have a feast prepared here. And there are 30 invited guests that are going to sit with me in this feast today. And you're one of them. You're a little bit late because you've been preoccupied. But he said, I told the cook to reserve a portion for you. <laughs> Amen. I don't know where we're at in God's timings. We might be a bit late. But I believe that God has reserved something for us in this hour that pertains especially to us, for us, in this hour in which we live. And he says to the cook, bring forth his portion that I told you to set aside for him. <laughs> Glory to God. How many of you want to get next to Jesus in this hour and begin to hear of that portion that he has reserved for his man in this hour? Amen? Lord, I want to hear those things that pertain to me in my day, for my life. For this present situation. That's my greatest need tonight, Lord. I want to know why I'm here. Why did you save me so many years ago? Why am I alive today? I've sensed all these years that there's been a purpose. But Lord, I don't feel that I fulfill very much. And I don't want to leave this scene before I have this sense of fulfillment. So that I, along with others who've traveled before me, can say, I have finished my course. Amen. Paul could say, I have finished my course. I'm not ready to be offered up. Isn't it terrible to come to an end and feel feel oh there's just so much I want to do yet. There's so much, there's so much and there's that wrestling with death uh, not wanting to let go because the, the, in the inner part of the person the spirit feels there's so much been left undone. But you know, I believe we can come to an end 
with a real sense of fulfillment. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I'm ready to be offered up. Do you believe that? That's part of the gospel. Hallelujah. And this whole scene here, this feast, where Saul, Samuel says, Saul, I want you to eat with me today. It speaks to us of fellowship. Fellowship. Some of the things that are called fellowship today are counterfeits. We get together and we do everything else but fellowship. The real fellowship. But folks, God has called us unto the fellowship of his son, Christ Jesus. And I want to read a passage out of 1 John to you to substantiate that. And I hope you're still with me tonight as we've branched out here and there a number of places in our message. John is writing in the first epistle as follows. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. This is one of the prime objectives for the preaching of the gospel, is to bring man back into fellowship with God. The real fellowship is with the Father and with the Son. How many of you want to fellowship God and his heart and his purpose? Amen. Get intertwined with all of that. Our lives caught up in all of that. Caught up in his eternal purposes. Hallelujah. And so God brings this man unto a place of fellowship. What a need in this hour to be brought to a place of intimate fellowship. In the days of Jesus, off and on, they, even the disciples knew that there was one that was in closer fellowship with the Master than the others. And that was John. And at different times when they wanted to know certain things, they'd say, ask him. He's closer. God draws closer into fellowship. And so Samuel says, now Saul, just stay with me here a while. I, I need to tell you some things. Stand still a while, the last part of, of verse 27. Stand thou still a while that I may show thee the word of God. Oh, my God, bring us to a place of stillness before him. Amen. Where God can communicate to us of his plan and purpose. Hallelujah. A man brought to fellowship. In the 10th chapter, we want to hurry and finish these thoughts here tonight. In the 10th chapter, we see God's man anointed. Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? You can see the various steps here in the preparation of God's man. God's man needs to be anointed from on high. And here we think of a work, that work which sanctifies you, for the anointing sets you apart. It's an anointing which sanctifies you. You're anointed for a specific call, a specific ministry. It's an anointing which commissions you 
And it's an anointing which empowers you or enables you. And all these things come through the anointing. Some people want a general anointing that they can do whatever they want to with it. But I would rather think of it this way, that you've got to know what God wants of you. You've got to know what his calling is, his commission, his work. And then in your response to that, God anoints you for that. He anoints you for a specific thing. In coming here, I, uh, my first uh, uh, knowledge of my coming here, my first reaction was, Oh God, I am dry, I am dead, I have nothing. But as I arrived today, as I was on my way today, I felt an anointing coming in the deep of my being. A quickening coming. What, what for? For this test tonight. Do you follow me? On our first trip to India a number of years ago, oh, how I dreaded it. It was a horrible, just the anticipation of it was horrible. And I tried to prepare myself. I tried to get grace to go. And I kept calling up here at Pinecrest and I said, I don't want to go. I just don't feel that I can go. I just don't feel anything. You know, when the anointing came and when the enablement came, it was in the day I stepped up those steps to get into the plane. You know, we think, oh God, you know, anoint me a month ahead of time. <laughs> Equip me. Give me all the messages. You know, oh Lord, I want to feel ready. Listen, you've got to feel helpless until that moment when you're right there confronting that need. And then you'll, you'll cry out and you'll draw on the Lord. You won't draw from anything in yourself. And it was in those days in India that I, that I learned to live one moment at a time. <laughs> one day at a time, drawing on grace for that particular day and for that particular occasion. But I do want to give a further thought about anointing. And I see something here. I want to set forth this thought for you, that I think there are some differences that we should uh, talk about between the baptism and the Holy Ghost and the anointing resting on our life. Now, let me say this first. I don't believe that having had the baptism of the Holy Ghost guarantees an anointing forever. Don't settle for one experience. You may have been slain under the power. You may have uh, been out for five hours. I don't know. Wonderful. If that's your experience, great. But listen, that's no guarantee that you, you're an anointed man or woman tonight. The anointing... Listen, the baptism, the, the Holy Ghost is a gift from God, but for an anointing you must pay a price. Yes. You can't walk carelessly with God and retain an anointing. You can't dabble into all kinds of things out there that are unclean and in the world and, and shady dealings in your life and, 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 and grieve the Holy Ghost and think that you're going to have an anointing to minister, to work, to, 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 to uh, uh, be God's uh, vessel. It just won't work. And I think that we see this in, in type from the Old Testament, how that when the priests were anointed for their ministry, it was this order. They were first washed. They were washed, which speaks to us of a washing by the water of the Word. We need to be a, a constantly exposed to the Word of God in our being, God speaking to us, which cleanses us. They were first washed, then they were clothed. They were clothed. All their whole body was covered, the various robes and all of that, and also the mitre was set on their head. And that speaks to us of clothing ourselves and being clothed with his righteousness and his holiness. You know, there's an interesting scripture in, in, uh, in uh, Hebrews 1.9. Uh, uh, I can't quote it exactly. It comes out Become an anointed people. Amen. Those who live in the presence of God, those who are fellowshipping not with unclean things, but with God and his word and his spirit, those are the people that will carry the anointing. You can't live out in the world and, and, and expose yourself to all kinds of things and still maintain an anointing. But here's a man that goes forth anointed out of that time of fellowship 
with Samuel. And let me hurry on here. Here we see God's man with his life redirected. Hallelujah. Do you see the difference here? Here was a wanderer who was looking here and there for the solution of a problem. Now, here's a man that's set on a specific pathway. Samuel says to him, when you depart from me, I want you to go to a certain place. And there you'll find three men. They're going to uh, give you some provisions. And he says, and from that place, he says, I want you to go on forward from there. Verse 3 of chapter 10. That speaks to me. Hallelujah. That there is a certain pathway that we are to follow in this hour. There's a specific course that you and I are called upon to pursue. And it's not an hour to turn to the right or the left or to wander around. But it's an hour to go straight forward in the way that God is setting before us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, I don't believe the path of the just needs to be uh, light one day and dark another and, and uh, gray another and all. The path of the just is as a shining light which shines more and more under the perfect day. Hallelujah. We need to get our eyes upon it. We need to hear the word of the Lord, the voice of the Lord daily saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Make straight paths for your feet. Hallelujah. And all the temptations are great. The voices are calling you from all these other realms. This is where it's at. Over here is where it's at. This great ministry, this realm, and so forth. Oh my God, may we hear God's voice pointing out the way whereby we must go. Hallelujah. Toward the end of John, Peter sees the apostle John following after Jesus. And he gets a little inquisitive and curious, and he says, what shall this man do? But Jesus said to him, he said, you just follow me. What is that to you? If I would that he tarry till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. It's so easy to get our eyes on what the other fellow's doing. And we think we've got to do what he's doing. He seems to be prospering. Let's go over and learn how he's doing it. Let's learn the, 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 the gimmicks, the tricks, the ways. Oh, my God. I wonder what all Jesus meant when he said to his disciples, Ye are they which have endured with me in my temptations. Jesus had temptations. And I believe one of his temptations was to take a different route. Take a different way. But I thank God that he ended up in Gethsemane with the kind of response to his father that said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Amen. Taking the father's way holy and fully. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. A man whose life is redirected. Samuel said, After that thou shalt come to the hill of God. Well, let's take this figurative. Man has fallen to such an awful, terrible, low place through sin. How many of you believe tonight that there's a lot of ascending to do? Ascending. Jesus came down, thank God he came down to where we were and he extended his hand of love and grace and mercy and has lifted us up out of the pit and the miry clay. Hallelujah. God's work of grace and redemption is to lift us, lift us, lift us. But there comes a point in our experience where he says to you and me, now you come up hither. As he did to John in the book of Revelation. John, come up hither. And there's a point in our experience and there are ways in which you and I, and someone was talking about an act of our will. By an act of our will, we can say, Lord, I will ascend. I will return back to my Father. 
As for me, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, you, you may be thinking of all the negative I wills of Satan, but I do believe that, that God is waiting for a positive response in our will, that we need to respond to that drawing power of the Holy Spirit. You know, folks, that's the way it is. Come on now. God draws us, but we have to respond. Draw us, Lord. Yes, but we have to respond and say, yes, Lord. We have to ascend. You've got to climb the hill. Come on up. Don't you believe that God's raising a prophetic voice in the earth today to his church? His church that's earthbound, that's wallowing in the mud and the mire and out there in the world. And he's saying, oh, church, come on up there out of that world. Get up out of the earth, please. Shake yourself from, from the dust, O daughter of Zion, and get your back to Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Ascending the hill of the Lord. Hallelujah. There's an ascension in this hour, I believe, necessary to God's heart, to God's purpose. Hallelujah. To a higher realm in the spirit. In that ascension, hallelujah, we're going to find, we're going to meet a prophetic flow. Praise God. There's a mountain today. I hope we're not too tired yet. There's a mountain today. Amen. There's a mountain, which is God's habitation, let's call it. And there are a people that are ascending up the mountain. Praise the Lord. There's a flow coming from that mountain. Amen? There's a prophetic flow of the mind and will and purpose of God. And, God, and Samuel said uh, to Saul, as you go up that mountain, you're going to meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and tabret and pipe and harp before them, and they shall prophesy. Praise God. Amen. There's a people that are, have been climbing the mountain. There's a people that are ascending in this hour and they're being touched by something on top of that mountain. Hallelujah. It's that thing that's coming forth out of the heart of God and their lives are being quickened. Amen. And they're going forth with a new word in their mouth, with a new dimension of worship in their mouth, a new dimension of praises in their mouth. Hallelujah. And I have a feeling that we are touching that company tonight. Amen? A prophetic company. My, may God illumine our understanding as to the meaning of a prophetic company. A people who've touched the heart of God and who are going around selling their own bill of goods. A people out of whose mouth is flowing a living stream. Hallelujah. A present word. The truth of God for this hour. Not worship as a form. Hallelujah. But singing and praising and worship with power and authority. A new company of people. I want you to know that God is doing a new thing in the earth. He's out of the mixture of denominationalism and all this popular religion. God is separating and calling unto himself a prophetic company of people. Hallelujah. That will not settle in this dimension of the earth. Please. Praise his wonderful name. They're not going to wallow in the mud and the muck that man is producing in this hour. They seek like Abraham and the heroes of faith another dimension another country hallelujah and there's the promises of God for us in that matter and as far as I'm concerned I want to align myself with those who are saying yes we seek a country amen do you seek a country my God you go and you visit other places and you feel well maybe there's something good going on over here or over there that we need fellowship and my God you can hardly stand it now, I say that, I try to say that respectfully. But there are dimensions, and then there are dimensions, and there are dimensions. Oh, my God, my God, my God. God wants to lift us. God wants us to ascend. One man said to me long ago, let this be a rule of thumb or a guideline as far as our fellowship. We, we can hear the ecumenical thing or the religious thing says, we ought to fellowship everybody. Fellowship, everybody. Let's have fellowship in our community. 
Well, I often wondered about this. I've, I really used to try and try and try and try and try. I honestly tried. But I found it was all a superficial thing. It was all just a courteous, you know, we get together. How are you, brother? How's, how's your church? Fine. And, 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 and so forth. And, and on it goes. No real fellowship. And one time, a brother spoke something that was so profound and so illuminating to me. And he said, Brother Valori, he said, fellowship is based on light and not on love. He said, God loves everybody, but he can't fellowship everybody if we walk in the light. As he is in the light, we have fellowship. Come on now. And your fellowship in other realms of darkness or semi-darkness is only limited at best. Fellowship, real fellowship, is based on light. That's, that's not, you can't get away from that. You've got to be of light, precious faith for there to be that real inner flowing, inner interchange. You've got to have a broad, common ground. And that's not knocking people who are out there in a certain calling and serving God and doing what they're called to do. I say, God bless them, and, and uh, we can meet and we can, we can uh, uh, have an interchange uh, one with the other, and so forth, and but as far as an as an in-depth, continuing type of situation, it just does not does not materialize. All right, I want to hurry it up here. You've been a patient audience here tonight, but there's an ascending. There's an ascending, and in this ascending, we meet something. Hallelujah. And in this ascension, something happens to us. And the, Samuel said, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. <laughs> You're going to experience something new, Saul. And thou shalt prophesy with them. And shall be turned into another man. Glory to God. Thou shalt be turned into another man. Hallelujah. And I'm sure some of you have experienced that already. Touching that prophetic flow and touching that company of people who are truly flowing in the Spirit and in this new order, and you find that it does something for you, it does something in you, that you're, you, you, you're, you're transformed and the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. Now I want to, I want to uh, point out another truth in this, and then I think we're going to close Beloved, God's man will undergo all these things and many more which I'm not mentioning, I'm sure. But also this, and that is, he will be placed under authority. Samuel gives him a command. And when, when someone gives you a command, you are being placed under authority or given the opportunity to be under authority and to exercise obedience and submission. Every one of us, if we're going to be a part of God's man in these last days, will have that opportunity. We'll have the blessed opportunity of being under authority and of exercising obedience and submission. That's a very vital part of God's preparation for his man. Samuel says to him, You shall go down before me, verse 8, to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. God's man will not be a law to himself. There's a lot of anarchy mushrooming in the church today. Everyone wanting to do their own thing. But he says, Samuel said, now look, in seven days I'm going to come and then we'll, we'll do sacrifices. And you wait. Don't you do anything until I come. 
and I will show thee what to do. Well, if you would, you don't uh, need to turn to this, but if you would notice in 1 Samuel 13, and you, some of you will probably remember this, that when this situation materialized, you know what Saul did? I'm reading it out of 1 Samuel 13, 11. Samuel said, What hast thou done? When Saul saw that the people were getting restless and afraid and of the situation and they were beginning to scatter from him, he went ahead and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings in disobedience to Samuel's command. And when Samuel arrived, he said, what have you done? And Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you came not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash, therefore said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal and I have not made supplic supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself therefore and offered burnt offerings. He took matters into his own hands. He became guilty of disobedience. He usurped the priesthood, became a law to himself. It was an act of rebellion. It was a grave sin. God will not have anyone in the throne that's going to take matters into their own hands. But if we're going to be a people called to the throne, we have to learn submission obedience and to walk very carefully with those things that the Lord alone is speaking and doing. So that even though we are, can be inspired up to a point here in what has taken place so far in the, in, in the apprehension of Saul, we find that, that he is put under authority and given an opportunity to learn obedience. All right, that's another matter, another, that's uh, uh, other chapters in the story. But for tonight, for tonight, we find that here's a man, and I want to close capping this up, here's a man that was God's man for that hour and for that need. And God chose him. He was delivered from his preoccupation with earthly things. He was apprehended, awakened, he was brought into intimate fellowship with God's prophet. He was anointed and set forth onto a pathway that would have been blessed of God had he pursued it. Because God would have given him opportunity. He said, I'm going to give him a chance. And if he does well, we're going to accept it. But he failed. But tonight, how about you and me? I felt very clearly and strongly in my room today that there was a work that needed to be done in this meeting tonight. And I knew that it would not be an outward spectacular thing such as someone coming to the front or a miracle or anything like that. I felt it would be a deep inward work in somebody's heart and spirit. And I'm going to ask you to stand now. Would you just stand? And can we just open our heart and reach forth to him? And perhaps what might be necessary for us at this moment is in some of those areas tonight, in areas of truth that we've gone over, you have felt that it has applied to you and your situation and perhaps God would desire nothing more tonight or expect nothing more for, for you to say, Amen, Lord. Amen, Lord. Do that work in me. Perhaps you've been one preoccupied, preoccupied, and unaware of that God is interested in you and, and has called you and chosen you for something 
higher and greater than what you're involved in. And, and if, you know, you say, how do I know that? I believe you can know that in your spirit tonight. Amen? You can know that. Oh, you, you, can, you can sense that when somebody's talking. I know that when I've heard, when I've heard messages along the line of, that everyone has their moment, their moment of destiny. It's a time when you do your thing, in other words, you, you, you come forth and you're involved in that thing which you've been born to do and called of God to do. I know that when people talk like that, when ministry comes along and talks like that, there's something inside of me that says, yes, that's true, and you haven't come to your time yet. Brother Wilbur has the word for, I don't know whether it's Kyrene time or what, but it's something along that line. It's that moment for which you have been designed especially of God. Do you, you, are you with me? Yes. It's that moment. That, and something inside of me knows that my time is yet ahead of me. Even at this time in my life, after 35 years in ministry, my time is still, is not yet. And I feel, my God, my God, uh, help me from, keep me, Lord, from becoming preoccupied and deliver me, Lord, from spending my time and energies and things that, that uh, would cause me to become dull to your voice and to the revelation of your will. I feel that I'm touching in an area tonight that applies to all of us. Brother David Wilkerson has written in, within this past year uh, something along this line, the conspiracy of distractions. Distractions, things coming in that demand your attention. And we give, we give our time and our energies and we do this and we go after that and all, after a while we find we, we dry up and something is wrong. Oh my God, deliver us from our preoccupations. And let the Holy Spirit pinpoint that to you. It might be your career. It might be even your church work. Sometimes our church work can get us so preoccupied that we miss the higher thing. We, 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 we miss knowing God and knowing His will. Hallelujah. Some of you may need an awakening tonight. Some of you may need to know and to hear that God has chosen you. Oh, hallelujah. God causes us to know tonight. Hallelujah, that not one person in this building is, is uh, uh, insignificant in your purpose, but very special in your purpose of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, my God, awaken us. And, and Lord, we believe tonight that there can be and will be a communication, amen, of your will and plan to our lives as we're drawn into a place of fellowship and relationship with you. Hallelujah. Maybe some of you have not responded to the call, such as Samuel gave to Saul. He said, Saul, linger here with me. Come into the inner chamber here. I want to sup with you. I want to share with you something concerning your life. Hallelujah. Will you say an amen tonight? Amen. amen. Will you respond and say, oh Lord, forgive me for just putting your voice aside and in those times when I have felt the drawing of your Holy Spirit, I've let other things come in first until my whole day has frittered away. And I've come to the late at night, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, and I've tried to, to somehow tune in, but out of a weary body and mind, Lord, I've been unable. Now, the reason I can say that is I've experienced that. <laughs> my God, help us. Amen? And let us believe in this convention that there will be a renewing of our minds. Amen. A lifting, a literal lifting. And as our brother said earlier, that we might be, ascend, uh, be able to ascend to the dimension of the throne. Amen. Do you believe that? I believe that. I'm claiming that for this convention. Amen. That the hold of the earthlies will be broken in us. Glory to God. Amen. There will not be an earthbound people pursuing earthly uh, interests and projects, but all coming aside in this hour like Samuel, ministering to the Lord, waiting on the Lord until his voice 
and his commission become a clear thing in our understanding. Praise his wonderful name. Oh God, hallelujah. Will you just call on the Lord in your own way? Hallelujah. Just cry out to him. Call on the Lord. Pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Just reach forth in your spirit. Call on the Lord. Hallelujah. I come to thee, Lord. Out of ourselves unto thee. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Glory to your precious name. Glory to your precious name. Do you sing that chorus here? Lift us up. It's an old chorus. Lift us up into the greatness of God. <clears throat> I'm sure if you don't, though some of you know it. It's an old, old chorus, and I'm sure if you don't know it, you'll be able to pick it up quickly. Lift us up.